So I'm going to tell you about an initiative. It's a, a multi-centre initiative running across Australia, and I'm very pleased that Western Australia is involved. It's called ICED, Immediate Cooling and Emergency Decompression. Turns out one has to have one's acronym, and this was a pretty good one. And it's essentially looking at cooling and whether or not we could use that to improve the outcomes for patients. It's a very important issue, and it's something that I will convince you, I hope, that we need to do very early, extremely early, after the injury. You will see the funding that's been available to, this is um, for myself, uh, it's the work that I've done, and just to comment again that it was the funding from NRP as well as seed funding from Skin, which in fact was given to Peter Batchelor in Melbourne, that really helped get all of this going. So we're very grateful and hope that we can continue that collaboration. Now, Chris talked about this problem of the data and we won't really know a lot about this population and Spinal Cord Injury Network is doing a lot of work to try and develop a registry to help us there. But in the meantime, spinal cord injury is inexorable. It's roughly one a day if you look at it and it seems to be something that will always be one a day, uh, at least in this country and with our demographics. There are probably about 10,000 people living with spinal cord injury uh, in Australia and New Zealand. And the cost for that is about two billion. So that's, that's a lot of funds that is, that is needed to look after these people. And the lifetime cost, as you can see there, is very substantial. So anything that we can do to improve the outcome for those living with spinal cord injury is going to be uh, very important and make a difference. So I think one of the things we need to understand is that the brain, uh, the body needs a brain and the brain needs a body. And that might be very obvious, but you just have to think of certain conditions where tissue becomes denervated and you, you very quickly get into trouble. So even if the cornea loses its innervation, it's often the case that that eye will have to be removed because it's just not working properly. The eye dries out and becomes infected. If you're unfortunate enough to have polio as a child, or spinal cord injury as a child, your legs will not grow because there's an intimate relationship between the nervous system which are providing lots of growth factors to the legs and the, the, the muscles and the such like. So they really are, it's a very intimate relationship and when you unhook the two, as happens in spinal cord injury, um, you have some very serious consequences and this won't be new to many of you in the audience but I'll just go through it now to emphasize as I do to the public and less cognate audiences that spinal cord injury is not just nothing. I have heard someone say to me earlier on in the piece when I was setting up a program called the Move Again program to try and look at physical activity, someone said to me, but why do they need to exercise? They're in a wheelchair. <laughs> and to me I found that absolutely astonishing and really set about trying to get the message out there. So as a consequence of the forced inactivity, having to be in a chair and the unloading, together with the massive assault on the body, there are a lot of metabolic changes, uh, you end up with a, a number of issues. So patients are initially seriously critically ill. There's a catabolic attack on the body, so the muscle breaks down, the bone breaks down, that overloads the kidneys, and you can have kidney uh, damage. There's a metabolic syndrome simply from not moving, but it, it's worse than that because your blood vessels aren't working particularly well. So when you exercise, you actually have to exercise harder to get the same effect compared to an able-bodied person. There are endocrine changes, vascular changes, which we will hear about later on this afternoon from uh, Dr. Gillian Swain, and particularly in the area of uh, pressure sores, pressure injuries. Um, then there's the bladder-bound sexual dysfunction. Um, interestingly, following on from what Chris was saying, we're actually running a workshop at the upcoming ANSCOS meeting on just how to tackle this problem. There is research in Australia, but not a lot. We want to get together and really look at how um, bladder health can be improved, because that's the one thing that actually pulls people back into hospital. Many do, but that's the major, that's the major issue. The other important point 
is inflammation. We now recognize that not only do you get an inflammatory response at the injury site, but also throughout the rest of the body. And that um, for, causes many challenges, including organ failure. And then there are the issues to do with the psychosocial aspect. And also we now know, we used to think the peripheral nervous system remained intact, but it doesn't. It actually breaks down to a certain extent. So we have some major, major issues to, to tackle. The basic research, the science in the lab has been very active and I got onto the web and, and put in a few um, search um, queries into PubMed in fact. And you can see this extraordinary growth in the, the numbers of papers that are published on just rat and mouse. And essentially you can group them into three areas. One on the left is to try and replace damaged tissue perhaps with stem cells. The middle one is to try and prevent that catastrophic loss of uh, tissue. So you see the blue rim on the left-hand side at one hour, which is virtually gone by two months. There's a progressive loss of tissue. And the other is to try and regenerate new circuits. Leah, do you have a, a pointer? I don't have a pointer, not to work. Oh, it doesn't work, never mind. I shall just be dramatic here. So those two little um, white things crawling across the screen, they're growth cones, they're the tips of growing axons in fact, in a frog brain. We would like that to happen after spinal cord injury in humans. It does a tiny bit, but often it's very dysfunctional. So that's the basic science, and we, learn, we know a lot more about spinal cord injury. Um, but there's, then there's the clinical side, and this is where the spinal cord injury network has been extremely useful in being just that, a network. So one of the committees that we currently have uh, the Clinical Trials Committee, which is in fact now chaired by um, Professor Brian Freeman in the audience, is to look at this issue around clinical trials and how we can involve Australia. And we are certainly doing that. And this is funded primarily uh, in the first instance by another state government, the New South Wales state government. And part of my, part of the things that I, one of the things I do is I get onto this amazing website called clinicaltrials.gov and I look at all the clinical trials that are currently running. And I've been doing this for about four years now, as you can see from the data. And it's going up. There's a lot of activity in this area. Clinical trials are very expensive to run. What's striking is the very large number of different um, issues that people are looking at. Two things. Um, if you put all the exercise together, that's the largest component. Drugs is pretty large, and cells is really coming up the rankings. But there isn't one on hypothermia in there, which I will be talking about. So despite the fact that we've had all this basic research in the lab, and we've got a lot of clinical trials going on, we've had um, no, no, no treatments that we can routinely use to really, really make a difference. What we do have is much improved medical care and management such that patients who had an injury in World War I would only live for about three weeks, whereas now the life expectancy is very similar to able-bodied. So what happens? Well, basically it's a combination of force and compression in a traumatic spinal cord injury. So you get a, a, a fracture dislocation of the vertebral column with the thing going out of alignment. Sometimes the vertebrae um, actually splinter, they have a burst fracture and the pieces of bone penetrate the spinal tissue. And you can also get disc herniation. And all of this then, as a consequence, narrows the spinal cord and press, puts pressure on it, it compresses it. And you can see the sort of consequences in the histology. That's a human spinal cord on the right. Um, and you can see, no, you can't see, that's not going to work, so never mind. So if you look at the cellular level, so that's the initial injury, but what's happening is that the injury cascades that happen in that uh, damaged tissue are very severe, they're very rapid. Within minutes, things start going wrong. So that circle of red events on the top is happening pretty fast. And on the bottom left-hand side, you've got a cross-section of a um, spinal, rat spinal cord with an injury on the left. And by 24 hours, there's a trans, of what's called a hemorrhagic transformation across the whole of the spinal cord. You are wonderful. Now, which, now what do I do? The red one? Ah, thanks. It's spread across to the other side. This is what happens in stroke, very dramatically, hemorrhagic transformation. And these are some histological sections from rat 
one day and then one month and six months and you can see this spread from the center outwards and up and down the spinal cord. Now I turn to the stroke area because they've really got this issue about time. And there's a concept now, time is brain. The sorts of damage that we see in cells is happening in within five minutes. And uh, Dr. Linda, Lindy Fitzgerald, who's sitting at the back there, has done some wonderful work on plotting out exactly what happens at these early stages and what we can do about it. But in the stroke area, a large ischemic stroke, which means a blockage of the vessel rather than something that's bursting open, it occupies a pretty large portion of the brain. And as soon as that happens, you start losing neurons. And it's staggering. Uh, if you just look at those numbers there, you know, 830 billion synapses in an hour, per hour. And if you compare it to normal aging, for every hour of a stroke left untreated, it's about three and a half years of aging. So we have to act fast. And that's what they do in stroke. They have, I've, if any of you have been in a hospital recently, you see these all over the wall fast. So if there's any change in the face, the arms, the speech, or the time, you know you have to get that patient in really swiftly. And the gold standard now is to have uh, the clot-busting drugs for an ischemic stroke, not a hemorrhagic one, in within about three to four and a half hours. And there's also some very interesting work now going on on actually removing the clot so that you get the perfusion back into the brain. Because it's very important to diagnose ischemic and versus hemorrhagic, you don't want to put a clot-busting drug in someone who's got a bleed in the brain. It'll make it much worse. So you need to get them into CAT scanners pretty quickly. And there's a move, certainly in Germany, to have CAT scanners in ambulances. And I think that also happens in Victoria. So it needs to be fast in, in stroke. And I am arguing that it needs also to be fast in spinal cord injury. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you exactly what happens in spinal cord injury. And this is an extraordinary paper from a group in China headed by Professor Xu Gong, who I have known quite well over the years. This um, was a study in which he took spinal cord injured patients, and the paradigm at the time was to wait for about three days until the damaged tissue was surrounded by a cyst. The cyst was then cleaned out, and I'm going to show you a movie of this in the next slide, so be prepared. Out comes the bad stuff, and in went the Schwann cells, and they were having remarkable effects with actually patients uh, walking uh, after this kind of treatment. What Zhu Gong argued was it was nothing to do with the Schwann cells, it was more to do with the debridement of the injury. So here we go, this is the movie, and you can see this. So this is the... Uh, spinal cord and a, a long slit has been made that way and the damaged tissue is coming out of this central cyst in the middle. It's being aspirated out. Now this is a very invasive surgery uh, and what you're hoping is that you're not going to damage any intact tissue that's left and that is a risk but these patients did walk afterwards or some, many of them did but that's just to emphasize what we've got to stop We've got to stop the rot. And we think that we can do that with hypothermia. So just a little bit more about the basic science. Once you've compressed the spinal cord, uh, it turns out that the intact spinal cord doesn't actually care very much. You can squish it to about 50%, it'll be fine. If you damage the spinal cord and then squish it, it gets into trouble very swiftly. And if you then, and most of the studies in animals only do the damage, they only hit the spinal cord, they don't keep compression on there. So most of the animal studies do not match the human situation of continued compression. In a lovely study um, from a number of people, if you then decompress, you get uh, a, a much better outcome. And this green bit is the extent of the damaged tissue if you have your decompression at two hours, six hours, and so on, you can just see that it spreads. So the clinical studies in hypothermia have been interesting, and there have been a couple of, uh, sorry, in decompression, decompression, that you need to do it early. You need to do it uh, as early as you can, and that's been one of the problems because many of the early studies for decompression just did it too late. They were doing it days, uh, whereas once you got down to hours, 
you began to see improvements. And these are the two standout studies. This was um, the early, was around about 14 hours, and they got an improvement in, in the patients being able to um, show an improvement in their function. But still, it was probably too late because we're still talking 12 hours, 24 hours. And I would like to put it to you that if time is brain in stroke, then time is spine in spinal cord injury. And I think that's something that we should really work on. This is an extraordinary study from South Africa of rugby players who had a fracture dislocation. And these patients underwent closed reduction. Uh, and those that did so in less than four hours, five out of eight had a full recovery. Those that were longer, much poorer outcome. We also have in the audience uh, a remarkable lady called Katie Ferguson, and I met her through the, the skipper, the physical activity training. Here she is, and she doesn't mind if I tell her story. She was on holiday in Bolivia in a bus, which hit a speed bump. She went up and down onto the floor, and she knew that she'd had a spinal cord injury. The reason she knew was because she'd had another one previously. So she'd injured herself the second time. The bus just happened to be going en route anyway to, to this hospital here because another person on the bus was ill. So she got in. She was greeted by Dr. Ferrari, who insisted that he operate within four hours. There was discussion with the insurance companies in Australia who wanted something different, but Katie's family and Katie said, no, we'll go ahead. She, an injury was what AISA, that's the worst sort of injury, and she is now able to stand independently. So time is spine. So if you've got to get the decompression happening, how are you going to do it? It's very hard to order, you know, organize the surgery in, in a short time. So what you need to do is have something else that's going to buy you time, and we think that hypothermia is it. So this is a, a, what happens in the animal studies. The spinal cord is crushed. You can't see it there, but because it's a, a CAT scan of the spinal cord, and then you put a spacer in to compress it. And when you remove the spacer with, over a certain time, the longer you leave it, the worse it gets. But if you have the animals hypothermic, you preserve tissue. And functionally, it's preventing all of those things that I've talked about already. And this is one of the key graphs, okay? So this is the score of the animals, and this is the days after spinal cord injury. If you, immediate, if you compress the spinal cord and then immediately decompress it, uh, and you see these two lines here, there's the hypothermia for the blue and the red for the normal, but no difference, because it doesn't make much difference at that early stage. If you leave it till eight hours, you get into real trouble, unless you give the cooling, in which case it's no difference between decompression at two hours with cooling. So you're buying time, you're buying about six hours, and that we think is really important. The uh, hypothermia actually reduces the, uh, the canal pressure, and it does it almost immediately. So this is without, that's the normothermic and that's the hypothermic, so down it comes, <coughs> all good news. Now, it's not easy to just go in and do this cooling, but we have a precedent, and there are two very interesting protocols which have just come out fairly recently, one on cardiac arrest, where they give ice-cold saline during um, at CPR, en route to the hospital, that's good news, and also traumatic brain injury, the same, they're giving hypothermia, so we're piggybacking on them to develop our protocols. There have been some extraordinary studies, uh, two, again, this was a footballer who had cooling within 30 minutes from doctors on the football pitch, and he then walked again. This was a study with a, a number of patients, about 28, showing improvement, but these, the cooling was happening quite late, so it was about an average of nine hours. What we're proposing with ICED is that we need to do the decompression within 18 hours to have any chance, and we need to do the cooling within less than two hours. Now, that might sound absolutely impossible and crazy, but we think that unless we're going to go for something that's really, really going to make a difference, we'll have another trial that shows very little difference, and we won't have any traction or any improvement. So can we actually do it? So eventually there'll be two arms, hypothermia in less than two hours with decompression and normothermia. So that's quite straightforward. But there's a lot of feasibility work that needs to be done. You know, can we actually do this? Do we have a trial? 
So the first thing we needed to know was, is decompression within equal to or less than 18 hours? Is that realistic or are we completely out of target here? So we've been mapping the process of care, the access to care across a number of units across Australia. And this was a retrospective study. We looked at a whole lot of medical records and this was quite a, quite a big thing to do. Um, and then we did a lot of data cleaning and put it into a database. There were nine participating sites around Australia and New Zealand, two in New Zealand. And um, we had a number of inclusion criteria, which were, we're interested in cervical for the moment. Um, but, and we looked between those years, 15 to 70 years. They had to have had closed or open reduction. And we had to know the time of the injury as well as um, when the reduction was done and be surprised how many patient records do not necessarily have those data in them. So again, it's the issue of the registry, Chris, where we need to improve what, how we're recording. So there are a number of obvious uh, exclusion criteria. The demographics were just as expected. We have a young age, a young cohort, predominantly male, and mostly traumatic, you know, car accidents and the such like. They were mostly cervical. And we have mapped out the process of care for 192 patients around Australia. And what we did was essentially to find out about the timing of the injury, details about the ambulance call, the hospital admission, because often or sometimes they will go to a pre-surgical hospital and not directly to the surgical one. Then how long radiology takes and then how long it takes to get to do the reduction. What we found across all the data was very encouraging and that the median time, the middle time to decompression, was 21 hours. So we're in cooing of the 18 that we need. And we think that there is potentially room for improvement. This are time blocks mapping the process of care. So the blue ones are all for the ambulance. So the first one is from the call to the ambulance arriving then the ambulance picking up the patient, and then the ambulance leaving the accident and getting to the hospital. Then there's the surgical hospital in pink, the radiology, and then the decompressive surgery. This is what happens when patients go to the non-surgical hospital first. They go to a, a, a pre-surgical hospital, and that's losing quite a lot of time. Sometimes that's absolutely essential. They have to be stabilized before they can be flown, for example, on the Royal Flying Doctor Service. But what's very apparent from this is the paramedic time is very brief. We can't make that any faster, which is good. They're doing a really good job. If we could get this out or reduced, that would go, give us more time. What seems to be taking time, the, the, the radiology is a fraction of the time in the hospital prior to decompression. What is taking time is the time to organize theater. And I know there are lots of challenges around there, but at least we now have the data. So, What's also happened here is the time in the pre-surgical hospital has decreased significantly. So there are improvements. It decreased in the years that we looked from about 30 to 21, and we hope that it can keep on coming down. And the main factor which actually reduced the time was um, the surgical hospital admission and actually reducing that. So there's lots of potential here. The other times in decompression were that um, closed reduction, which is obviously much faster, and all the cases for closed reduction was, were in New Zealand. Open is much longer. And the other one is metropolitan versus remote. So obviously, if you're in the metro area, you've got a better chance of an earlier decompression. This was an extraordinary paper from uh, Dr. Mr. David Dillon, a surgeon in Royal Perth Hospital. And he showed very clearly that if you have an injury in rural Australia, then you're less likely to get a good recovery. So A is bad, whereas if you have it in urban Australia, you get much better at improvement. So again, time is fine. Here we've got a plot, a plot of patients who actually had uh, two um, very early surgery, and you can see they got much, much better outcomes. So we think we're in with Nkui. That's the first thing. The next thing we do is can we do it in terms of looking uh, measuring the patients. So we need to be able to measure them very carefully. We need an acute outcome assessment. Now the current outcome assessment is something that looks like this. It's called the, a lot of acronyms here, I'm just going to call it the AIS, the Asia Impairment Scale. 
What you have to do is spend about an hour measuring sensory and motor function and then do a classification, which can be A, B, C, D, or E. Now, we don't have an hour in an ambulance. We can't take all the clothes off and, and do the sensory testing of all the der dermatomes and the such like. So we need something much quicker. And there's a precedent here from a paper, I, the details are there, and what they did was showed that if you just looked at motor function and sensory function at lumbar level three, and same for sacral level, if you just looked at those two, you were able to discriminate very, very clearly between independent walkers and those that could not walk. So just two measures were needed in that, and we thought we could use this in an acute setting, and this is what we've been working on. So we've developed um, a brief paramedic assessment tool called SPEED, and it has been pointed out to me that ICE and SPEED are perhaps not the best acronyms, <laughs> <laughs> the best acronyms in an emergency department on the weekend in Royal Perth Hospital. Unfortunately, we've got our acronyms and we're going to run with it, but I did feel pretty, pretty bad. But alcohol is, is much worse, as we heard on Radio National this morning. So this is SPEED. And essentially what we're doing is doing, um, can, can you move your foot and we score it? Can you feel at the ankle there? And that will give you the injury severity, either whether it's bad, A or B, or better, C or D. And then to get the level, we just touch there, can you feel it? Can you shrug your shoulders? Can you grip my hand? And ask about where they feel any pain. So all of that can be done in roughly less than a minute. So essentially what we've tried to do, we've developed the speed and we've looked at it by comparing it to ambulance records. Okay, a retrospective study is all we could do to start with. And there are the inclusion criteria. Now what was really interesting about this is we had to go through 360 records in order to get the data that we wanted and we could only find 58. So the actual recording, the way it's currently done, is not sufficient, which is why we need something like speed to put in the ambulances for staff, for paramedics to use. But when we did look at it in this pilot study, the validity of speed was very clear. And that, well, first of all, it was being done within about an hour, which was great. And we compared it to the, whether it's good um, CB or bad AB in the hospital with the eight hour full, full assessment through the whole body. And what we showed is that for 95% of, case, of cases with no foot movement, that predicted that you would be AB. So no motor, no motor function. And with 100% with foot movement, they uh, would be C or D, which is better. And the injury level, very similar. So those with um, weak hand grip or no grip with cervical, strong hand grip, thoraco lumbar. So we feel that we have the... Uh, the, the, the groundings to act, because if you don't have an outcome measure at that very acute stage, you don't have a trial. And we needed that. So in summary, the median time to compression, decompression is close to what is required for ICE, and we think we can improve it by direct uh, admission to a surgical hospital, as well as perhaps getting the, the patients into theatre faster, and I know there are challenges there. We also um, um, have very promising data on a, on a brief paramedic assessment. So the next steps, what we're already doing now, is to actually map the process of care for thoracic patients. And this is sh turning out to be a very different beast. It's a very different type of injury. Much larger forces required to break the thoracic spinal cord. And we're also doing a prospective speed study. So the speeds will be in the ambulance, the charts will be in the ambulance, and we will start looking at that in more, more rigorously. And, and filling that in. Those patients will be normothermic. They will not be hypothermic, and they will form the control arm for the trial in the future. And we also wish to develop something that we're going to call code spine for hospital admissions, so they'll call through and be prepared to receive the patients. So we're biting the bullet, and um, soon in Victoria, we'll be doing a safety study for hypothermia. Now, this will be for 14 patients, and the cooling is uh, described there. Now, no one has done cooling at this short time before, which is why we need to do the safety study. And I reiterate that we really need to try to go for two hours, because otherwise I think we will have another trial without a clear outcome measure. Um, the, out the 
what we will be looking is complications, and the pulmonary complications are the worst for these patients. But in previous studies, um, uh, people, uh, patients who are hypothermic showed no worse outcome compared to those that, that weren't. So we will be doing a prospective normal thermic, the safety trial, and then that will come together for the randomized control trial. Uh, hopefully starting next year. So can we make a difference? I think we can. I think we've got a lot of potential. Australia, we all know each other across the spinal units. Even if you could improve outcomes in, by 25%, you'd save half a billion dollars in a in year. So with that, I will just list the investigators here who've been involved in all of this, in particular Camilla and Alexander and uh, Peter Batchelor. So thank you very much.